this year, we're, gonna, we're talking about the, the elements that are necessary in a great house. And, and so not only a spiritual house, there's elements in our spiritual house that have to have these elements as well, but also in our personal lives, uh, in our homes and the place that we live in, that these characteristics are important and they build precept upon precept so that by the time you get to the end of the year, we all have built a, a solid core, a foundation of, of, of precepts of the kingdom of God. A, a precept would be in a structure that's in place to create an atmosphere. So the first precept is in a great house in January, we talked about love. In a great house, there's profound love. So that's a precept. You don't, you don't just kind of step into a house and say, I give you love. Let, this is a house of love. Well, what does that mean? And how does a house of love function? And how does intimacy in a relationship? It's not just physical. It has to be emotional. It has to be some time that you spend something, some quality time with somebody, and you sacrifice for them. What are the components that create that precept? If God is love, how do you know that? What are the precepts of God, the things that he creates to show you that he loves you? He, healing, faithfulness, responding to your prayers, showing up when no one else shows up for you. Those, those are ways in which God reveals that his love. It's not all rules and regulations, but it is some rules and regulations too. It's the dynamic interchange that we have with the living God. In a great house, there is profound love. You should anticipate that, expect that, ask for it. Uh, sometimes demand it. Demand it from yourself. You can't demand it from the Lord. But the Lord's going to bring what he's going to bring anyway. That's just the way that he is. But he, he's going to expect certain things that are reciprocal. If you put water in a freezer and you come back the next day, that water has changed its molecular structure has gotten dense and it's now ice. Well, if, it, if it's still water, you know you've got an issue. There's, some, there's a challenge with the power in this freezer. It's not working. It's not on. It's not, or this is not actually ice or water. It's something else. I'm just saying there's certain things that if they don't line up, then you've got to look at it. And so with God, there's this deep love that God has for you. And in that, he shows himself, and he reveals certain things. He answers your prayers, and he grants the petitions that you have in your heart, and he fights your battles for you. That's, that's one of the things God does. It's one of the characteristics. And so we live in this, this house of love, and we're able in that house to replicate love to other people. I'm just telling you what you can't give, what you don't have. And it's, it's, you're not going to be, we can't build great houses if the great house, the foundation of the house is not love. But you can't effectively love someone unless you experience love. You ought to, one of the things you, we should all pray for is, God, help me to know your love and to love like you love. Now, if you haven't, if that's not a natural part of your lifestyle, early in the journey as you're shifting to start loving people, it's hard because people are messy. People can be mean and, and obstinate. Um, and people are hard to get along with. And that's just in the morning when you're getting out of bed. <laughs> it's just hard. But, but because it's de a desire of God, he empowers you in your spirit and soul to live that. So you don't have to love your neighbor based on the fact that it's a, just a command of God. You can love your neighbor because the spirit, because it is a command of God, and it's one of those precepts. And so God comes inside of your heart and empowers you and gives you his love for your neighbor. And then you either got to act on it or you got to reject it. And if you reject it, he'll bring it back. And either you got to act on it or reject it. And if you reject it, he'll bring it back. And God will keep bringing it back until 
you are living in the, the precepts and the ways of God because his love is for you. And he will not give up on you. In a great house, we started talking this month, February, in a great house there is courage. There, courage is a requirement to do extraordinary things in the kingdom of God. And, and by courage, I don't, there's a lots of manifestations of different types of courage. Um, Sometimes you exhibit courage and you're not courageous in your mind, but you are courageous. That you, you take risks that no, other people won't take, or you go places and do things that other people won't do. Mother uh, Teresa, who did a lot of work with the poor and uh, very courageous. That's courageous activity. To take your sacrifice to be the difference, to give your life to be the difference for somebody else. And that's your whole life. Not like, well, on, on Thursdays, you know, just, just your whole life. That's courageous. It's unbelievable courageous. It's a reflection of the living God. So when you think about somebody that's doing extraordinary things, part of their life is courageous. There is great courage in the kingdom. You are courageous. If you're born again, the spirit of the living God's in you, God bless you for your courageous behavior. And God is going to reward that. I promise you that. Though it's great honor for you that's coming in the kingdom of God. Because in a great house, there is courage. Deep love stimulates courageous giving. You're not going to give big if you don't love big. And I don't mean just, I'm not talking about dollars. I'm talking about giving. Giving of your time, giving of, of yourself, giving of your activity. That you're not complaining all the time, but you're giving. It's hard to complain at the time that you're giving. Either you're complaining or you're giving and serving and honoring and loving or you're complaining. I've had to learn how to just keep the check from uh, not complaining because it's the atmosphere. Deep love stimulates courageous giving. Not just giving, courageous giving. And if you love deep, you'll give deep. If you love a little, you'll, you'll give a little. Sometimes, you ever been in a place where you've kind of given and then you say, enough, I'm in, oh my golly, I'm sick and tired of hearing that, you know. Or you had a, a, a child that's, you know, like six or seven, and, and, and they're relentless. All right, can I have that? Can I, can I, can I, mom, can I, can I please, please, mom, please. And you're like, do you want, do you want, me to get you know. Because they're just, they're relentless. They just, they're just, they just want something, I want that candy, Please, can I, can I, can they have this idea that this candy is like the most important thing. I can absolutely eat it in my life. God, please, please, please give me this. And they'll push you. And then you finally come to a place where you're like, you're, you're fried on the edge of that emotion. And you're like, if you say that one more time. Well, that's not really what you want to communicate with them. But he's gotten you to a place. People can do that. But, but courageous Courage allows you to push through that. The deep love stimulates your ability to be patient with them. And just ride the, ride the wave. Let's look at it in Luke chapter 21. <coughs> this is an, uh, an incredible example of this experience with a woman in the temple on a Sunday morning or Saturday night probably here in this culture. Luke 21, verse 1. He looked up and saw the rich dropping their offerings into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow dropping in two tiny coins. And you've heard this before. Truly, I tell you, this is Jesus' analysis. He's making an analysis of the giving in the temple. And he's, his analysis is so profound and detailed that it becomes scripture. So he's there, he's with the other disciples, and, and I love this about Yeshua, that he always has teaching moments. You, you should always have those times in the course of life where you have teaching moments with God. So if you, something's not working or something is working, and you ought to have a moment where you say to the Lord, okay, what's my, what's my lesson? What's my lesson? Because if you don't learn the lesson, 
you're going to have to repeat it. It's, it's like going to, if you're a teacher and you're in a class and, and a student fails the test and it's the final, he, you, you should have to repeat that. You can't just get that, right? Now, if everybody in the class fails the test, it's not the class. It's the teacher. The teacher has an issue. He's not or she's not in, giving enough instruction in a way that people would get it. So here's the thing with God. He wants you to get it. And he, and he knows how to give it to you so that you do get it. And if you don't get it, he'll work on it and make it right for you. Here's this poor widow. She's dropped in these two tiny coins. And, and here's what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For all of these people have put in gifts out of their surplus. But she, out of her deep love, put in everything she had because she has incredible courage that is demonstrated through her giving. That giving that Yeshua's marking is courageous giving. There's all the reasons why she should not give. I only got two tiny coins. I got I, I to gotta live. I got I gotta, a lifestyle I have to protect. I, I, I've got other things that are more important. Everybody's giving. There's a culture, an atmosphere of giving. And they give willingly and freely. But this woman has nothing. But her two tiny coins, they are everything. So we sing like the song, you, you can have it all. What does that mean to you? To me, that means the tiny coins. That means if I, I can't stand here and sing the song to him and be genuine in my heart and say to him, you can have it all. And then he says, I want you to be kind to Derizette. And I'm like, but kindness to my wife. You know, like, no, I can't. Eat. There's no exclusions there. I have to, got to give that one. And then when it comes time to give that, I got to give. When it comes time to serve them, I got to serve them. And, and, and really, it doesn't make any difference how many, if they don't get it. They don't, they, they just don't seem to get it. Well, I'm done with them then. Well, I can't be done with them. Because I said to him, you can have it all. They're his. And he sent me to serve them. So I'm going to do that. But that costs you. Yeah. And it's hard. Yeah. You turned your hair gray. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm devoted to him. And I've seen him all the time and, and tell him how much I love him. And, and, and all that's a mirage if I won't live it. It's not genuine. So he says her, he says about her that her giving was just courageous. Because hmm. out of her poverty. I'm just, I'm just saying, when, when, if you can create that, if you reach for that, if you'll reach for it in your, in your life, just reach for it. If you, just by saying, God, I'm reaching for that level of courageous giving in my life. He'll give it to you. He'll give you the ability to live like that. He won't have to reduce you down to widow's mites. That's not what he's doing. That's what she was. That's not where you are. But you, sh you should be one that, that just lives courageously and gives, gives with great gusto to the things of God. I'm, I'm constantly working on it. I never really have ever felt like I've completely attained it. And, and part of that is because every time I hit a standard, he raises the standard. And I'll hit that another standard, and he'll raise the standard. And part of it, you can say, you get frustrated that you're never going to make it, but you've already made it. It's not about making it. It's about honor. It's about honoring the king. It's about, about him building a great house in your heart or in your home so that he can use you to do his work in the earth. 
in a great house there is courage. And this woman is a courageous giver. And one day we're going to see her face to face. But not today. In a great house, I want you to recognize that a courageous lifestyle forges high honor in the kingdom of God. I'm going to say that again. It is a courageous lifestyle that forges, creates, wells high honor in the kingdom of God. You're, you're not going to have high honor in the kingdom without a courageous lifestyle. If you don't have a lifestyle that's courageous in God's eyes, you're not going to be great in the kingdom of God. If you're going to be great in the kingdom, it takes a courageous lifestyle here in the earth. Um, so I'm going to define that in just a little bit. But you've got, you got to be okay with the fact that, that God wants to honor you and desires to honor you, but it, it, it's costly. It does cost something. It's, not, it's free. Salvation is free, but honor in the kingdom, you have to earn that. He gives honor to whom honor is due. When it comes to a place where you're due honor, God will make sure you get honor. But what forges... Honor. What, what's the thing that creates this honor so I step into the kingdom of God and God has honor? Well, honor me. We'll say, well done for the faithfulness in which I have demonstrated. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. You know John 3, 16. Um, then the gospel of John. This is 1 John. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's it. Jesus gave his life. We should do the same. If you want high honor in the kingdom, give your life. I'm born again. Great, you're in. Now live a life that's worthy. But you won't have high honor in the kingdom if you don't give your life like he's given his life. He laid it down. Uh, was it painful? Yeah. Was it embarrassing? Yeah. Was it manipulation? Yeah. By the demonic realm? Yeah. Did Jesus fight it? No. What was his call for justice then? Forgive him. They don't, they don't even know what they're doing, but forgive them. Come on, forgive them, God. I'm just saying there's, there's high honor, but it's, it's, it's not easy to get it. But, but God will forge it. I use the word forge on purpose because it takes some heat to forge something, to take metal and forge and create and build. And it's painful sometimes. Come on. Don't quit early. Don't give up because it's tough. Because you just, this person, uh, it's tough. Adam and Eve in the garden. And Adam says to the Lord, the woman you gave me. He blamed. Didn't, he didn't take responsibility. And then she says, the serpent deceived me. At any point in time, they could have said, I'm sorry. I didn't understand. I didn't get it. Would you please forgive me? What's the Lord going to say? No, I'm not forgiving you. He just said yes. How do I know that? Because he's working the whole time. He puts a garden, I mean an angel to guard the way to the tree of life so that man doesn't have to live in this fallen condition forever. And we're still in it. Humanity is still in this fallen condition. Occasionally, those of us who are born again and live by the Spirit get a taste of the, of the kingdom of heaven. Occasionally, when we're praying or when the, when the presence of God and the Holy Spirit comes and you have a moment where the presence of God takes you and there's just, just incredible joy and peace and you can, and the love of God and the Spirit of God. You know what? That, that's every day in the kingdom. That's not a moment. 
It's not a moment where we have a feel good and we, man, I just felt like and the anointing of God is here, the presence of God. And, and God did miracles and he healed the sick and he healed this guy and my brother and he had cancer and God healed him. You know, that's every day in the kingdom. There's no, there's no sickness in the kingdom. There's no death. It doesn't exist. It's, it's not like people are saying, oh man, no one's died. It's, 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 today, it's, an, well, it's an, another record. It's not a record. It's, a, it's just the way it is. It's always that way. It's a constant lifestyle. But we don't have that constant lifestyle. We just have glimpses of it. A moment. It's like that in everything. We have moments. Moments that's really good. And things that happen really good. And you're happy and you're blessed. Praise the Lord. And there's other times it's not so good. It's like watching the Super Bowl this year. What an awful Super Bowl. It was awful. It's a boring game and, you know, and Seahawks weren't in it and the Cowboys weren't in it, so it wasn't good to start with, so... It takes courage to forge high honor. You ought to give yourself to that. I'm going to live a courageous lifestyle, a lifestyle of giving. And as you have given to me, Jesus, I will replicate that and give to others. I'm going to be patient and kind. And I'm going to replicate all the things you've called me to do. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to be just like you, Jesus. You've given your life, I'm going to give my life. If you're willing. He'll, he'll, he'll help you do it. Let me give you a third principle here as we're, as we're walking through uh, courage in, a, in, a, in our house, a great house. And this is a little bit for our nation. We can do certain things that we can do in our own life habits, but we, we have certain things we need to do in the nation. You can't control the whole nation, but you should control yourself. And when enough of us are in that level of control, there's a tipping point, and it turns a nation. But when a nation accepts ungodliness as normal, when a nation accepts ungodliness as normal, only extreme actions will reverse its course and culture. When a nation, I'm going to say it again, when a nation accepts ungodliness, when a nation has normalized unrighteousness or ungodliness, only extreme actions will reverse its course and culture. The challenge we're having in, a, in America today is that we have a, the, some of the foundational truths of the kingdom of God that the nation was built on are no longer foundational truths. And we don't live by those foundational truths anymore. Um, just honor and love and respect. Um, Grace and mercy, faithfulness, uh, doing what you're called to do, the way you're called to do it, according to God's standard. Wow, I don't feel like, well, it's not about feelings. I can appreciate the fact that you don't feel like that you can do whatever you want to do, but that's not the way of God. It, God has a standard, right? And so when a nation has taken that standard and shifted that standard out and brought in a new normal, have normalized that which God has not created as normal. Only extreme actions will reverse its course and culture. It can be reversed, but it's going to take some extreme actions. The things we're going through in America can be reversed, but it's going to take extreme actions. Now listen, here's a challenge with some extreme actions. They're extreme. They're extreme. They cause you to say and do things that you would not normally do. They're extremes. It's like me kicking down flipping this off or breaking this something here or the, on the, it's extreme and you're like what's going on oh my golly it's extreme God is extreme there's, there's times that God's right here in the center but God most of the time he's extreme the pandemic it's extreme weather changes pattern extreme I'm just telling you movement comes and God uses extremes I think America, the United States, is in an extreme condition right now, and God's using some extremes. And he's going he's to flip America back because that's my prayer and, 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 and God's desire, and he built this nation on a foundation. But it's, this is a young nation. It's only a couple, few hundred years. 
old. It hasn't been around like for thousands of years. It's been hundreds of years. And we have drifted some in the hundreds of years. We have built systems that are, that are ungodly, but we've dismantled some of those systems too. Slavery is no longer something that we live by in America. Uh, but we do have the effects of slavery still lingering in people's lives. But the core root have been destroyed. But the effects have not been destroyed. But when a nation accepts un ungodliness or certain precepts and things that we have accepted as godliness in the nation, it's not going to turn because we prayed on a Friday for, for a month. It's only going to turn through extreme actions. That will reverse the course. Genesis chapter 13, verse 12 says, Abram lived in the land of Cana. Abram. I notice this is early in Abraham's journey because he's not even Abraham. The scripture doesn't identify him as Abraham. It identifies him as Abram, father. He's going to be Abraham, but he has to go through some processes with God to qualify to get the name of Abraham. He only has the name Abram, father. He cannot be yet the father of nations until he does some different things in God's sight. And he moves into a different place where God is going to now release a new anointing inside of him. You, if you don't get the new anointing, you still have an old anointing. And sometimes your old anointing is enough. And sometimes it's not. And God puts a demand on you, and the demands are hard. And it's difficult. And there's people who are going to misjudge and not like you. And if all you really care about is people liking you, you're not, you're not going to meet the, the standard. But if you can sit there and give two mites, and all you have to live on is two mites, and you give that, you're, you're equal to the task of God's forging something of high honor in your life because you're courageous in the kingdom. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot lived in the cities of the plain and set up his tent near Sodom. Sodom at the time was a beautiful environment. It was open plains and and Abram had said to his cousin Lot, hey, listen, you, you choose. I'm going to let you choose what you want, and I'll go the other way. Because they were so prosperous, they could no longer live together because their compilation of all of their, their animals, their, their um, value was greater than they could, they could contain in a certain environment. So he said, you pick a place, I'll, I'll go the other direction. So he picks Sodom. That's where Lot goes. And Abram picks Cana. Now, here's what the scripture says. Lot lived in the cities on the plain and set us up his tent near Sodom. Verse 13, now the men of Sodom were evil, sinning immensely against the Lord. That's kind of like you're reading the Bible, and then all of a sudden the Bible kind of drops in just like, by the way, at 2 o'clock. You know, they'll be giving free hot dogs at Burger King. You know, you're like, what? What does it have to do with anything? Hot dogs at Burger King. You'll get that later. <laughs> he set up his tent near Sodom. So he's what? And then God just drops this in. Now, I want you to know something about Sodom. That Sodom is evil, and the men of Sodom are sinning immensely against the Lord. So I just, I just want you to know something. If, if, if there's a culture that's against the kingdom of God, God will ride it out for a little bit, but at some point in time, he's going to change it. And, and either we're going to sh shift some things in America as, as God's servants, his sons and daughters, or, or we're going to wait and he's going to shift it. But when he shifts it, man, it is shifted. It can be painful. It can be difficult. Um, so we should intercede. We should pray. We should do the things that's... God has called us to do in our watch because we have a metron, a measure of rule. And in our metrons, our measures of rule, we should reflect the living God. 
And I'm just going to tell you this. There's times that you have to do some tough stuff. Do it. Times you have to make tough decisions. Make them. The times that there's going to be sacrifice. Sacrifice then. Do what you have to do. Now, you get courage of that by being in an atmosphere like this, singing the songs that we sing, because when you sing or say something, there's a level of congruency that's in your heart, and your life starts lining up to the congruency of what you're saying. Even if sometimes what you're saying, you don't fully believe it, the more you say it, the more your life will line up to it, and the more it will, you'll believe it, and the more it will manifest. So that's why you should keep singing, you can have it all, even if you're like, I ain't giving nothing, I don't like it. But you can have it, because part of you starts saying, I don't even know why I'm giving this to you, but I'm just giving this. It just just, it just make any sense. I plan to keep this for myself, but I'm going to give it to you. And then part of them are not even happy that they gave it to you. And you, and you say, well, you want it back? I don't want to take it if you don't want to give it to me. No, 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 man, I'm, I want to give it. I just feel good about giving it. I don't know why I feel good about giving it, but just because God has created now congruency in your actions and in your heart. It's the beginning of congruency till you get to a place where it's, it's normal, that you give all the time or you serve all the time and you love all the time because it's normal in the kingdom, it's normal in your life. Now, here's, here's, here's what's cool about that. If you start living in a normal lifestyle that God has established in the kingdom of God, then the kingdom of God will come and live within your life, in your house, in your heart, and you'll be healthy because there's, in the kingdom of God, there's health. You'll be at peace because in the kingdom of God, there's peace. They'll have joy in your heart because in the kingdom of God, there's joy. And listen, miracles happen in your life because in the kingdom of God, miraculous things are every day. God comes to look at Sodom and as he's journeying to look at Sodom with some of the angels, he makes a decision to see his friend Abram, who is now Abraham. And the angels go to the city and God's stops to converse with his friend Abraham. Why would he do that? Well, one, because he loves Abraham. The second part is because Abraham has family in Sodom. And he knows what, he's, what God, God knows what he's planning to do, but Abraham doesn't know. Then Abraham, as he's having this interaction with God, starts to figure it out too. So he shifts into intercession mode. I'm just telling you what, and there's things in your life that are just not lining up. You can complain about it or you can make a difference. I'm just saying if you might, if you're just complaining, you might feel better about it complaining, but it won't change anything. You should shift into intercession mode. You should be in a mode where you stand before God and say, you, God, are great. What I love about the scriptures, anytime you see a leader in the kingdom of God and the people would do crazy stuff, that leader who was a good leader would always step up to be in the intercession mode. When the nation of Israel was drifting and going back and forth and there's, as Moses is trying to take them into the promised land and They'll go and not go, and then well, we had leeks and fish and all the other good stuff, and then and then and and then they complain about Moses like crazy. You're no good. You're the worst leader. We wish we were still back in Egypt, you know. And and then and uh, and God says to to Moses, Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a great nation out of you. I'm gonna I'm gonna just wipe these guys out and start over, and I'll make a nation out of you. And I'll fulfill my promise through you. If and he could have said, "Well, who am I to argue with you, God? You are you are always right, God. Yeah, your word, God, to be let let it be so, God." That's not what he says. He says, "No, God. These are the guys. Listen, at this this juncture, 
with Israel. These are the guys that are talking about going back to Egypt, selecting new leadership, and getting rid of these guys, Moses and Aaron, and killing them. And Joshua and Caleb are saying, we can do this. We can take these, we can return, our nation can be strong. And they're like, we don't, we'll shut up. We're going to kill these guys. And we're going back. And God says, enough, I'm tired, I'm killing them all. Then I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Moses should have said, in, today our leader would have said, amen. So be it. That's not what he says. He says, oh, no, God, no, God. These people that have rebelled against me, they want me dead. No, God. They don't want to do it. No, God. These are your people. These are the ones that you had promised. Then he starts working God. You know, if you, if you kill them here in the wilderness, they're going to say, the people will say, you weren't able to bring them in, so you killed them. But God, you are merciful. And he works God. And then God finally says, okay. Peace, Moses. This is good. According to your word. According to your word. According to your word. I'm just telling you what, there's times you are, we ought as a people get in intercession mode so God can say, eh, I hear you. According to your word. So Abram says, uh, says to the Lord through his intercession, if you find 50 people, will you, will you save the city of Sodom for, for the 50? And the Lord says in verse 26 of Genesis 18, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole, the whole place for their sake. What? You're going you're to spare the whole place for the 50? Just only 50 people. If you got 50 righteous people, you're going to spare the whole place? The whole thing you're planning to do will completely be aborted if you could find 50? Abraham answered, since I have ventured to speak to the Lord, even though I am dust and ashes, suppose the 50 righteous lack five. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And he replies, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Then he spoke again. Suppose 40. Suppose 40 of them. Then he said, Lord, then he answered, I, I, I will not do it on account of the 40. That's his time, God, Abram's talking with God, and he's also calculating in his head because he knows a lot. Let my Lord not be angry, verse 30, and I will speak further. Suppose there are 30. He's working him. Suppose there are 30 found there. I will not do it if I find 30. Then he said, since I have ventured to speak to my Lord, suppose 20. Suppose 20 are there. And God says, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Golly. See, there's a call for somebody right now to say, you're not just, destroy them. That's not God's way. God's a merciful God, and he's going to extend, he's going to ride it out, he's going to hang in there, he's going to persevere, he's, I'm just telling you what, and if, and if you're a great lead in the, in the kingdom of God, and, you're, and God has marked you during this hour to be birthed during this season on this planet for a reason. And Abram's Every time he said, okay, I've, I've said a lot and I've, I've worked a little bit, but if, if you just listen to me a little bit more, if you, if you God, I could, could put up with me, just, if I could just have a second more of your time. I'm just telling you what, you've got to get into a place where you're willing to take some risks too with God. What's in your house that needs to be restored? What's in your community or in your neighborhood? What's in your, in your own life? 
Then he said, let not my Lord be angry. Verse 32, I will, I will speak one more time. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. If I can find 10 in the whole city, I'll not destroy the city for the sake of the 10. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abram, he departed and Abraham returned to his place. Here's, here's the, the point that, that I want to make and then I'm going to close. God is merciful. When you're coming to talk to God, one of the key characteristics in the, na in the conversation with God is God is merciful. God is always a merciful God. He's always going to operate through some measure of mercy. You ought to be merciful. When you're merciful, you reflect God. When you're if you, if you take the heart of intercession and, and, and begin with intercession based on mercy, and when the angels hear your voice, they're not going to be completely sure if it's your voice or God's voice because it's the same voice. And they're anxious to execute the, the, the commands of the living God. They will execute them. But they're executing your commands because it's the same command. It's God's voice. May we have the nature and the spirit of the living God so that we look like him, talk like him, act like him, live like him. God is merciful. Be merciful. Be courageous in your giving and in your faithfulness. The nation is going to shift. Our nation is shifting. It's shifting back to godliness but it's going to take some extreme actions.